fallout from the virus. Uh, Bob, we'll kick it off with you and this rally that just keeps building. Yeah, and uh, it started early on. We gapped right up. Great overseas numbers. And uh, then when Governor Cuomo started talking uh, a couple hours ago, we moved up on, of course, his comments of hopes for a possible plateau, all that very carefully couched. But the market took it positively. You don't see these kinds of days very often. I just want to point out that we are, I call it markets in the middle. We are now 20 percent off of the lows with that 6 percent move in the S&P 500. So from the February 19th high, we're now down 22 percent. Remember, at one time we were down 35 percent. That's a long, uh, long ago number here from March 23rd low. Now we're up 20 percent. So a, a, a bull market to a bear market to I don't know how to characterize this anymore, but we're 20 percent off of the lows uh, that we hit on March 23rd here. We're having a great day. A lot of ETFs most beaten up are rallying the most. The retailers are all up big today. Wayfair, for example, all up. Dillard's, Groupon, Kohl's, Macy's, all on the upside. The regional banks, or uh, KRE, is up 8.5%. Best day since March 26 for the banks here. Some of the regional banks all up 4 or 5%, as you can see here. And the home builders are just on fire. The ETF, they're up 14% overall. Lenore and Pulte all rallying heavily today. Staples are the big lagger. Remember the big leadership group? Kroger's up every day. That's not happening today. They're all lagging. Clorox, Campbell's Soup, and General Mills all up, but not participating much in the rally. Guys, back to you. Yeah, I can't believe in turning negative. Bob, we appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Bob Bassani. Okay. Let's get over to Rick Santelli now for the latest on the bond markets, Rick. Yes, Kelly, we are seeing yields move up a bit, but up a bit. Seven basis points. Look at a two-day chart. Uh, we're in the mid-50s. Now we're slightly above the mid-60s, and we do have a bit of a cushion. I keep pointing out 54 basis points, the all-time low yield close, and we're still at a distance that makes many investors a little nervous. Sometimes lower yields are more of a caution sign than anything else. A year-to-date of the investment-grade Barclays, always fascinating to watch this. And the reason I'm alluding to it is even hovering under 300 basis points. At one point, it was close to 400 basis points. But do remember, at the end of last year, coming in this year, it was under 100. And it's very competitive at these levels, especially when you look at the new issuance market that have come alive. TY VIX, it's like the VIX for stocks, except for this is for the 10-year part of the curve. And you can see how it's gone from 16 to 6%. Finally, two-day of the dollar index. It's losing a little bit of its steam here, uh, getting close to unchanged. Can't seem to break through 101. But do remember, it wasn't long ago we were under 95, which means we're, we've had a 4% uh, four rally in basically five weeks. Kelly, back to you. Yeah, I hear 95, Rick. I don't know if you're talking the dollar, the 10-year. I mean, the, the levels that, anyway, uh, in that case, like you said, it's all about the greenback. We appreciate it. Uh, let's get to some breaking news from the Fed and a rapid update on the economy. Steve Leisman, what is this breaking news we are talking about? So the Fed just announced that it will create a facility, Kelly, by which it will buy these small business loans from the banks that are part of this PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, it said it will provide term funding and it will announce the details in just a few weeks. This answers a question that we've heard about from the banks, which is, well, if they juice up their balance sheet with all these loans, they're going to reach a cap at some point in time. Fed's going to fund them, take them off their books, I assume, uh, the way this facility will work. In other news, we've been tracking the outlook for the economy, the downturn, and the upturn together, and it has taken a turn for the worse. Basically, what's happened here is those worst-case scenarios that were grabbing headlines, 30%, 25% declines, now become the consensus scenario. So if you look at the survey we've done of eight economists now uh, looking for a 27% decline in the second quarter, that is the average, uh, followed by two decent quarters of a rebound that's looking a little bit like a V, 14% and then 10%. And if you look at the next chart, what you see is how much that outlook has deteriorated from the survey we did back, we went back to the 19th of March, and how much worse it's gotten, both with the expansion of the uh, shutdown, as well as the concerns about contagion. First quarter now more deeply negative, second quarter. But of course, the harder they fall, the harder they come, the better they come back there with a better second quarter rebound. Janet Yellen talking in an exclusive interview with CNBC, talking about her hopes for still a V-shaped recovery. A V, which is what we're all hoping for, is really a best case scenario. And if 
um, activity could begin to resume, as many assume, in June and maybe be back to something more normal by the summer. Uh, I think a V is possible, but I am worried that the outcome will be worse. And it really depends to my mind on just how much damage is done uh, during the time that the economy is shut down in the way it is now. It also depends on government aid. All the forecasts I showed you earlier of that third quarter and fourth quarter rebound rely upon additional government aid. But Goldman's saying that more is going to be needed than what's already put out there now, especially, Kelly, aid to the states. Back to you. Yeah, Steve, let's go back to this news out of the Fed for just a moment. Would this be additional lending to small businesses or this would be in, this would encourage the existing lending program? No, this is going to encourage the existing lending program. So this is going to really uh, use this 350 that's out there and it's going to give the an individual bank more capacity to do more of that lending so that they shouldn't get cut off because of balance sheet constraints, I would imagine. I haven't seen the facility yet, but my best guess here is that what it's going to do is be able to take the loan. Now, the legislation does provide for the ability to sell these loans. This should be a way for the Fed to either fund them or, or buy them uh, in some way that creates additional capacity on banks' bit, uh, uh, balance sheets so they can provide more loans. It doesn't increase the cap. However, there is, as you know, Kelly, a massive chunk of funds from this legislation, 450-odd billion that's going to go to the Fed, that can be grossed up. And ultimately, and we'll talk about this maybe more tomorrow, this is going to be 10 times bigger than the small business lending program once the Fed gets going with its Main Street lending facility. I'm told it's a top priority over there to get that facility together. Absolutely. And I'm glad for our, our own ability to process all this. They're kind of happening one at a time, but obviously we want all to get up and running. Uh, Steve, we appreciate the clarification and the news. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Steve Leisman. Uh, the major averages are rallying pretty hard this afternoon on some hopeful signs out of Europe and other U.S. hotspots like New York about a slowdown in virus cases and deaths. Is the market right to believe this crisis may be getting under control? Bahan Janjigian is CIO of Greenwich Wealth Management. He joins us now along with Brian Jacobson, who is multi-asset strategist with Wells Fargo Asset Management. Bahan, you know, are, are you encouraged? I mean, obviously we want a slowing in the number of new cases uh, not an increase in the number of deaths, but what more would you like to see here? Well, I am encouraged. Obviously, the markets are encouraged today, and uh, the bottom line is nobody's really paying attention to the economic numbers, looking at death tolls and new cases, um, and that's how they're trying to determine when the economy can back, get back up and running again. So it, it certainly would be extremely encouraging news if we see that flattening of the curve. Uh, today we have some evidence that perhaps we're near the peak. Um, and as long as investors believe that there's a good chance that the economy will, uh, people will get back to work uh, in another month or maybe six weeks, then, then I think we could go higher. I think we've seen the bottoms. But if this takes a turn for the worse, and I think it's too early to tell, but if it does take a turn for the worse, and uh, investors begin to believe that it's going to take another two months or even longer before people go back to work, uh, then we will test those lows of March 23rd. All right. Tyler? Kelly, good to see you, uh, and welcome, everybody. We had a little trouble with the shot here uh, from my home, but I'm with you now. Brian Jacobson, why don't you react to what Vahan just said? Uh, and specifically, what if things do not come back all that quickly? It isn't a snapback. Well, that is one of the dangers is that uh, if you do get uh, a resumption of economic activity is what does that actually look like? What is that path to recovery? Uh, it's obviously been a very abrupt slowdown. Uh, you can liken it to being like uh, we're going through an economic winter at the moment. Uh, the key question is, is whether or not this has become an economic ice age where it's going to last multiple quarters. And then what does that fine of conditions look like? Our best guess is that it's going to probably look Look, um, uh, very unique, very unusual. Uh, we've uh, seen in the past snapbacks in economic activity from recessions. We've seen long trudges higher. Uh, so we're really positioning portfolios for kind of that more sawtooth pattern, just because there is a risk that if you get economic activity resumed too quickly, you could get a bounce back in terms of the number of uh, infections if there isn't a vaccine in place. So it is very conditional as to whether or not uh, when they resume activity, is there a vaccine in place? And that likely isn't going to happen for a while. 
No, that's. I think that's. I think that's one of the things that people all worry about as whether there, there's going to be either some breakthrough therapeutically or in terms of a vaccination. Brian, I. I guess one of the things that I worry about economically is the return of the consumer and the consumer's willingness to get out of their houses and go out and gather and spend and do the things that they did. The consumer, you know, it's an article of faith that it's two thirds or more of the American economy. And if that doesn't snap back quickly, not only either because people don't have jobs or because they're just gun shy about going out and spending, that could really slow things down even if the virus is largely uh, recumbent uh, within a few months. Yeah, you're absolutely right that that is a risk. However, the consumer is going to do what the consumer does best, which is consume. Uh, thankfully, it seems like the policy response has been proportionate to the problem as far as expanded unemployment benefits, uh, sending out checks to households to maybe prop up consumption. But there's not a lot to spend it on right now if you can't go out to uh, various businesses. So I think that uh, you know consumers are going to consume. It's just going to be in a different way. And that's the way that a lot of our equity portfolio managers mm-hmm. are trying to figure out is exactly how will consumer consult, what will that look like going forward? We're going to probably get that bounce back. It's just what will they actually spend right. it on? Vahan, you know, energy has been hardest hit among all the sectors, basically. Is it time to start nibbling at energy stocks? And if so, which ones? Yeah, you know, I, I think it is time. And of course, energy has been hit for a long time, even before uh, the coronavirus started to spread. But if you are a long-term investor, then I think it would be uh, time to start adding some energy stocks to your portfolio. Um, and I, and this is a bit of a contrarian point of view because the way I'm thinking about it is that, you know, right now we're in a world where we have a glut of oil and not enough demand. So I could see, um, for example, a scenario where companies start shutting in production, uh, the economy then starts coming along, and then all of a sudden inventories get drawn drawn down and the price of oil goes up. Um, I don't think that'll happen for uh, at least another year, but I can see that scenario. So it would make sense, in my opinion, uh, to add those stocks. And uh, the safe way to play it is to add the large integrated companies, you know, perhaps the Exxons and the the, um, Chevrons. But uh, if you want to take a little bit more risk, uh, you can add a stock like uh, Murphy Oil, which is a um, a, uh, exploration and production company. Right. Vahan, thank you very much. Uh, Vahan Jan Gigian and Brian Jacobson, we thank you very much for that. All right, let's go over to Meg Terrell. A new partnership to treat the coronavirus uh, using antibodies was announced today. And we just spoke to the CEO of one company behind that effort. Uh, the, uh, the, it's Veer Biotech. Spoke to him last hour, and Meg has more on that. Hi, Meg. Hey, Tyler. Well, Veer Biotech is a young biotechnology company that's partnered now with British drug drug giant GlaxoSmithKline. Now, the focus that they're working on, at least initially, is an antibody treatment. And what this involves is actually looking for antibodies from people who have recovered from infections with the virus that causes uh, causes COVID-19, as well as SARS, sort of the original um, coronavirus uh, that affected us 20 years ago. Now, uh, they have two antibody candidates. They say they plan to start a phase two trial with within three to five months. Uh, GSK is also making a $250 million equity investment in Veer as part of this partnership. And they're going to be testing a couple different approaches, essentially looking at whether this uh, treatment uh, can prevent the disease, whether it can prevent the disease uh, from becoming severe, and whether it can treat severe disease. We talked with George Skangos, the CEO of Veer, about all those approaches and the timelines. Take a listen. We are planning to do these trials on a worldwide basis so we can enroll very quickly. Uh, The follow-up period is typically will be 30 days or a relatively short period of time. So we're hopeful to get through the clinical trials in a matter of months. Uh, And then um, uh, assuming the antibody works to make that available to people as quickly as we can. So these timelines, guys, are faster than really we've ever talked about before, but nothing about the situation we're in is normal, Normal, Tyler and Kelly. Absolutely not. Meg, Meg Terrell, thank you very much. All right, and coming up, stocks in rally mode with mortgage mayhem. The former head of the Federal Housing Administration will join us to explain why he thinks trouble is brewing in the housing market. 
That's next. Are you curious what others are listening to on TuneIn? Head to the trending section under Browse to see the most popular stations and podcasts among TuneIn listeners right now. Check it out. You might just discover something new for yourself. way to discover the latest and greatest sports audio on TuneIn? It's easy. Just make sure push notifications are enabled on your phone to receive recommendations of sports talk radio and podcasts, along with important breaking news updates. Get social with TuneIn. Follow TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to discover what's happening in the app and around the world. Be the first to know about upcoming games and the hottest new music. Follow at TuneIn and always be in the know. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn from the App Store today. Hey everyone, it's Tremaine Lee, MSNBC correspondent and host of the new podcast, Into America. In our latest episode, Republican giant and longtime Senator Lindsey Graham is for the first time ever facing a real challenge to his Senate seat. Can a relative newcomer to the scene, a black Democrat in a red state, win this fight? I head to South Carolina to find out. Search for Into America wherever you're listening right now and subscribe. You love listening to ESPN Radio live on TuneIn, but did you know you can also listen to favorite ESPN shows on demand? Get the latest takes from Stephen A. Smith, got dynamic duos all over the place, as Dan LeBatard, to- and Gallic and Wingo. When it fits your schedule, and listen to episodes of Pardon the Interruption. Pardon the Interruption, but I'm Israel Gutierrez, and I love hosting the show with my humble around the horn and highly questionable as podcasts anytime you want. Search ESPN to see all the podcasts on TuneIn. This is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Join me for CNN's new podcast, Coronavirus, Fact versus Fiction. We know you have questions. We want to help you find answers. And send me your questions on social media at Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Make sure to search and listen on TuneIn today. Student Loans. Welcome back, everybody, to Power Lunch, and let's get over to Sue Herrera now for the latest on the coronavirus. Sue? Thanks so much, Ty, and good afternoon, everyone. Wisconsin's governor, Tony Evers, has ordered a two-month delay of that state's primary vote, which was set for tomorrow. Wisconsin Republicans, though, say they will challenge that order. Evers, a Democrat, has been unable to strike a deal with Republicans to reschedule the election. In Europe, France reporting a new surge in deaths from the coronavirus. They are now up by more than 830 since yesterday to more than 8,900. But here's an event that isn't being canceled. Lady Gaga announcing a One World Together concert will be televised on April 18th to help raise money to fight the pandemic. The star-studded lineup includes Elton John, Paul McCartney, Stevie Wonder, and Chris Martin. There you see the head of the WHO, Mr. Tedros. The entertainment industry, she says, has already made some big donations. I'm proud to say that um, over the past seven days, we've raised a total of $35 million uh, for the Solidarity Fund. This money will include essential PPE, supplies and testing kits around the world, and will help improve lab capacity to rapidly process tests. It will also coordinate uh, research development We'll have more for you next hour. We expect a news conference from uh, New Jersey's governor, Mr. Murphy. And as always, if you want more on the coronavirus coverage, you can head to CNBC.com. And Kelly, we expect some new numbers from New Jersey shortly. Back to you. Okay, Sue, thanks. The director of the National Economic Council, Larry Kudlow, said earlier on CNBC that $38 billion in loans have been approved for small businesses. Question now is when will that money get into the hands of the business owners? Kate Rogers is here with a look at that for us. Kate? 
Hey, Kelly, that's right. We do know as of right now, 130,000 loans have been given an SBA loan number for a value of more than $38 billion. But as you said, the question remains how much of that $38 billion has actually made its way to Main Street. Remember, this is a first come, first served program. So we're hearing from many small business owners who are anxious. We've heard from some who've been turned away from banks. Some are waiting in queues. Some have been contacted by their banks to move forward with this process, which is good news. We've even heard from two business owners that have gotten loan numbers from the SBA, but were told by their bank that they needed next steps and guidance from the administration before the loan could actually be dispersed. We've seen some tweets from the SBA talking about small business owners that have actually accessed their money in their cash, but we have asked how much total has been lent out to small business owners from banks. We haven't yet gotten an answer to that. We do know more than 2,400 lenders are now a part of this program. That's good news, and it's up from last week when there were just 1,800 lenders that were a part of this program. The SBA also has a lender hotline, they told us, that will be up and running today to help onboard more lenders and hopefully get more cash out the door. But once again, first come, first serve. A lot of business owners want to know how much money has gone out and how much still remains. Guys, back over to you. All right, Kate, uh, we appreciate it. Kate Rogers. Ty? All right, Kate. Well, we got the Dow up about 1,200 points. Kelly, energy stocks lagging the broader rally today, as they have on many days lately. Uh, as oil continues to fall, Halliburton, the latest company to uh, lay off some employees, uh, we got much more on that right after this short break. Plus, the mortgage market could be turned upside down if borrowers stop paying their bills. And we'll look at what the potential damage could be with the former head of the Federal Housing Administration. That is next. Stay with us. Keep up with everything happening in the wild world of pro wrestling with a TuneIn podcast. For expert analysis straight from the WWE to Steve Austin's no-holds-barred conversations with wrestling's biggest personalities, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling to listen. world and how we interact with each other is changing, but that will never change who we are at Lexus. Now, more than ever, you and your needs come first. Find out what service options are available in your area at Lexus.com forward slash people first. When you look at the critical issues facing our world, what do you see? We see breakthrough medicines getting to patients in record time. We see harnessing natural gas unleashing the promise of clean energy. We see engineers simulating the future to improve today. At Emerson, when issues become inspiration, focusing core strengths to create a better world isn't just a result, it's a responsibility. Emerson, consider it solved. For many of our members, being prepared won't be a new thing. And it won't be their first experience with social distancing. Overcoming challenges is what defines the military community. USAA has been standing with them for nearly 100 years and will be here to serve you for 100 more. Our retirement plan with Voya gives us confidence. They help us with achievable steps along the way. So we can spend a bit today knowing we're prepared for tomorrow. Wow, Dad. Do you think he overdid it, maybe? I don't think so. What do you think, Peanut? Nope. Honey, you think we overdid it? Overdid what? See? We don't think so, son. Technically, grandparents can't overdo it. That's impossible. Well-planned, well-invested, well-protected. Boya, be confident to and through retirement. Let's do this. I want to be a rock star so bad. Shark Tank, We Heart Music Marathon, tonight, 8 Eastern. CNBC, get yours. And catch Trolls World Tour in theaters and at home on demand, April 10th. Welcome back. The mortgage market is at risk as hundreds of thousands of borrowers apply for the government's homeowner bailout amid the coronavirus outbreak. The former head of the Federal Housing Administration will join us in a moment, but let's get to Diana Olick first for the details on what's happening here. Diana? Well, Kelly, on Saturday, a broad coalition of mortgage and finance industry leaders issued a plea to federal regulators for desperately needed cash. Requests from borrowers for the federal mortgage forbearance program are flooding in at an alarming rate. Servicers are granting those monthly payment deferrals with no questions asked as required, but the servicers still have to pay mortgage bondholders. The coalition said the scale of this forbearance program could not have been foreseen by mortgage servicers or fully anticipated by regulators. It is therefore in 
incumbent upon the government to provide a liquidity facility for single-family and multifamily servicers. Any further delay could lead to greater uncertainty and volatility in the market. Now, I spoke with Jay Bray, CEO of Mr. Cooper, the largest non-bank servicer in the nation with close to 4 million mostly government-backed loans. It alone has already granted over 86,000 forbearances. Bray helped regulators to set up the plan and was told there would be federal cash for servicers, but it never made it to the final act. He says without it, there is going to be complete chaos. Servicers will go under, leaving even more borrowers in the lurch. Joining us now for his take on this is David Stevens, former FHA commissioner during the subprime mortgage crisis and former CEO of the Mortgage Bankers Association. Dave, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you, Diana. Now, you disagree with the way this whole forbearance plan was set up, that borrowers don't have to prove any financial hardship. I'm told it was set up that way so borrowers would get relief immediately. What's your issue with that? Well, I think there's a, a, a tension here where you don't want to be using federal dollars at a time like this uh, to give it to, to give it to people who do not need it. The, the forbearance program is an extremely effective way to help those who have job, real job loss and can't make their mortgage payment. But the way this is being rolled out, it's fraught with moral hazard. It's open to anybody, whether they're uh, wealthy and have paychecks and continue can continue paying their mortgage. Uh, as well as those who truly need the money. Um, and unfortunately, that's just going to balloon up the total size of uh, borrowers who execute and take the forbearance plan, put in an extraordinary burden on uh, the private sector and ultimately the taxpayer. And for the servicers, why do federal regulars who set up this plan not see the disconnect here that servicers can't afford this kind of massive spike in payments that they now have to come up with for the bondholders? Well, that's the real shocking part about this. And not only is this a unique forbearance plan because anybody can get it and all you have to do is go to your mortgage, you know, where you make your mortgage payment, go on the website and click a button uh, and skip six months worth of payments, maybe another six months. Um, but the hard part about this for the private sector is the, the sheer size and scope of this provide, was given no support uh, by particularly Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, and their regulator, FHFA, who has the authority uh, to create this uh, liquidity advance for the for the private industry um, could have done so, and they didn't. And it's inexcusable, in my view, that federal government did not step up, step in after creating such a massive program and provide the support for industry. Um, it's getting worse, Diana. I, and I'll I'll just give you just one example. I've I've spoken to a, a variety of lenders today across the country. Uh, mortgages are drying up, especially for first time home buyers and those that need a mortgage the most. Because of all of this uncertainty, the question of whether these companies are going to be able to survive, we need to back up uh, what we do as a, as a federal government, whether through congressional legislation and through the regulatory community, by rolling out these programs to make sure that industry can survive and continue to provide liquidity to the housing market, which we will desperately need as we start coming out of uh, this recessionary period, at least coming out of being locked in our homes and going back to work. Right. Commissioner Stevens, it's Kelly back here in the studio. I just want to clarify something because it seems that a big part of what's happening in the mortgage market is also because low rates are causing huge prepayments and refinancing. So it's kind of a double whammy right now uh, for investors. So understandably, they're pulling back. For the people who forego payments for a few months, as my understanding is that gets added to the principal. So it's not clear to me why a lot of people would want to choose to forego that for a few months if they're going to have to pay it off at some point anyway, and they do have the means. So just like your thoughts on that as you respond with, you know, what else authorities could do here to make sure the mortgage market doesn't dry up altogether? Yeah, so I, I you know, I was in the, I was uh, the Federal Housing Commissioner during the last Great Recession, and we required what's called hardship. You had to prove uh, that you had lost your job and you could no longer make your mortgage payments because we were concerned about protecting taxpayer dollars at the time and not giving it to people who did not need it. But to your point, um, it's, it's interesting how the repayment programs will work. FHA, for example, you really don't have to repay the loan, uh, the, the advances, until you pay off the home. They simply get tacked on uh, the back of the loan in what's called a secretary's lien, which is the formal term for it. Uh, no interest, non-interest bearing, and it just becomes something owed down the road. So I guess uh, for people who even can't afford to make the payments, being able to get sort of interest-free money, thanks to what Congress has permitted here, uh, is a really questionable step. And so while we're hopeful, and Director Calabria of FHFA has 
said publicly he's hopeful people will be honest and if they can afford to make their payments, they will. I'm hearing stories from real estate agents and others across the country who are telling me that's not always the case. And Dave, is the FHA particularly vulnerable here? I mean, you were there during the subprime bailout. FHA really saved the market in that sense. They are getting some liquidity, though, from Ginnie Mae, are they not? We're getting liquidity from Ginnie Mae, but uh, understand how this works. Well, FHA guarantees all these mortgages. And after the servicers outlay six months' worth of payments, which they'll make to the investor, uh, they can submit what's called a partial claim to FHA, and FHA will reimburse the servicers for all of those payments. Now, six months is a really long period for forbearance generally anyway. It's longer than usual. It can be extended for another six months. Uh, the MBA, Mortgage Bankers Association, has estimated the cumulative impact here. If 25% of all eligible borrowers opt in for this, it could cost somewhere between 75 to $100 billion of advances. Uh, the portion that's FHAs will ultimately have to be reimbursed, and they already got in trouble once before. We remember that. Uh, we don't need to repeat this same problem that, that happened in the past. All right. Commissioner Stevens, thank you so much for your time, sir. We appreciate it. And Diana Olick, thank our thanks to you as well. Such an important story. Ty? All righty. Still ahead, oil set to snap its two-day winning streak, uh, despite reports that the Saudis and the Russians are nearing a deal on production cuts. What's next for OPEC and its allies and its frenemies? Uh, and finally, as the death toll in the coronavirus pandemic keeps climbing, we will talk uh, with B Bishop Robert Barron about how he is handling the malaise that is permeating society. A crisis of faith coming up. And remember, you can always watch or listen to us live on our app, the CNBC app. Uh, get us on the go. We'll be right back. Our special breaking news coverage continues after this. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn from the App Store today. A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial. Except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. Keep up with everything happening in the wild world of pro wrestling with the TuneIn Podcast. For expert analysis straight from the WWE to Steve Austin's no-holds-barred conversations with wrestling's biggest personalities, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling to listen. Get social with TuneIn. Follow TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to discover what's happening in the app and around the world. Be the first to know about upcoming games and the hottest new music. Follow at TuneIn and always be in the know. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Not all heroes wear capes, but most wear tights. And here we go, guys, underway! Cover! Oh, Rowan! Wait Keep up with everything happening in the wild world of pro wrestling with the TuneIn Podcast. For expert analysis of the latest WrestleMania, turn on the WWE Podcast. Or listen to the Steve Austin Show for no-holds-barred conversations with wrestling's biggest personalities. It's good to be here tonight. It's an empty building. But I'm for these and more, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling. This is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Join me for CNN's new podcast, Coronavirus, fact versus fiction. We know you have questions. And we want to help you find answers. And send me your questions on social media at Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Make sure to search and listen on TuneIn today. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. April 6, 1992, Duke's men's basketball beats Michigan 71 to 51, winning back-to-back -back titles for the Blue Devils. Fired, and here comes Duke on the break behind the back, Hurley the Hill. Why not? That's the play that was available. Nobody back for Michigan because they're sending five to the board. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. 
Welcome back to Power Lunch. Let's get a check on the markets right now. We've been green across the board all session, and we're close to the highs. We've erased all of last week's losses already. The Dow's up 5.5%. So is the S&P and NASDAQ, and the Russell 2000 small caps are up more than 6% today. All 11 sectors are higher. Utilities, materials, and tech is your leadership today. Utilities up more than 7%. And all 30 Dow stocks are higher, led by Boeing, Raytheon, American Express, and Visa. We have moves now of more than 15% for Boeing. Also some big moves in the retail sector today, including Wayfair, which is up a whopping 38%, PVH, Nordstrom, and Capri Holdings all up more than 24%. Tyler? All right, Kelly, thank you very much. The oil market is uh, closing for the day. Uh, crude finishing lower by almost 8%, snapping a two-day win streak. This is questions remain on whether Russia and Saudi Arabia will reach a deal for production cuts amid very, very seriously dropping demand. Brian Sullivan joins us now with that story. When you look, Brian, at the demand destruction that has occurred as a result of the shutting down, basically, of the American economy and economies around the world, it's really breathtaking. It could be 30 million barrels a day. I mean, that's 30% of global demand, Tyler. It's about 100 million barrels. The United States uses about 20 million barrels a day. About half of that is for just driving around. Of course, nobody's driving around. So gasoline demand is way down. So you're looking at 30 million, 25 to 30 million barrels, depending on your estimates, taken out. Now, a lot has been discussed about this potential deal to get 10 million barrels. The market's got a lot of hope on 10 million, which, by the way, is not 30 million. And I'm kind of going back and forth. People, they say, well, you know, Russia and Saudis can do 10. Others say no way. Let's walk through some bath. What I've done, guys, is I have math, not bath, although I probably need that as well. Here you go. I've walked through, aggregated a bunch of research reports, and everybody's trying to figure out where this 10 million may come from. These are estimates based on everything I'm sort of reading, okay? Saudi Arabia maybe can do 4 million barrels a day. The rest of OPEC, you call that, I don't know, they, you know 2 million for being optimistic. Russia, probably 1.5 million. The U.S., 1.5 million, and then no can. Norway and Canada, as I call it, another million. That's how you get to 10. It's possible some could do more, some could do less, but that's kind of the basic math around this 10 million, but that's, that's still not 30. All right, Brian, hang on, because I want you to participate in this next discussion as we talk a little bit more about the oil market uh, and what's playing out there with Francisco Blanche. He's the head of Global Commodities and Derivatives Research for B of A Securities. Francisco, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, oil has come up in recent days, but is down today, even though the sector seems to be holding in, at least the equity uh, parts of it, holding in reasonably well. What do you see as we move forward, uh, and how much hope do you put on the Russians and the Saudis being able to reach some kind of production agreement? Um, I think the Saudis and the Russians um, are probably going to agree on something. Uh, it was always our baseline scenario that we we're going to see uh, both both of the players uh, come back to a negotiating table. Um, the big question mark here is whether the U.S. is going to agree to some uh, prorated cuts uh, through, for example, rationing by the Texas Railroad Commission or the province of Alberta. And there is a precedent for that uh, 15 months ago where the province of Alberta issued uh, mandatory cuts across all producers. Or alternatively, we're just going to have to see the, the lower prices, the price declines, force shut-ins across America, and that's effectively what's been on offer. So we, we don't know exactly the shape of the U.S. response, but I do think that Russia and Saudi Arabia are definitely getting a lot closer. For, for those of us who do not know, Brian, I'll get you in in just a sec. For those of us who do not know, why is the Texas Railroad Commission central to this? Well, because um, the authority to order uh, production restrictions lies at the state level um, in, in many instances. Um, so uh, unless you're talking about uh, federal lands and, and uh, essentially areas that are controlled by the federal government, mm -hmm. most of the, uh, most of the uh, uh, arrangement and, and certainly the number one producer in the country across the states is Texas. So the Texas Railroad Commission is, is central to this because it's been, it's been basically managing oil uh, licenses and oil leases for uh, over 100 years. And that's why that's why it's such an important body here. Fascinating. Brian, jump in. Well, by the way, so, so the companies, the two companies that originated that motion that Francisco is talking about, Pioneer Natural Resources and Parsley Energy, the head of Pioneer Natural Resources is Scott Sheffield. 
He's pushing for this. He is on Fast Money with us tonight. We did an interview with him recently, very vocally outspoken about everything that's going on. He thinks that Exxon and others are trying to destroy the mid company. So he'll be on at Fast Money tonight at 5 o'clock. Tune in for that. Parsley Energy, the former CEO of Parsley, is Brian Sheffield, his son. He's not the CEO anymore. So a little family action going on there. But they're pushing the Texas Railroad Commission to institute these cuts. I mean, it truly is a remarkable time when you've got the oil industry basically begging a regulatory body to control output. Tyler, what's amazing to me, I did not know this, Rystad Energy, respected research firm out of Norway, says there's 9,000 different American producers, any from ExxonMobil all the way down to some guy with a, you know, a small well in his backyard producing a barrel a day. Try to, you ever try to wrangle 12 kids? 9,000 oil producers. Trying to get them to agree on anything could be tough. All right, uh, gentlemen, we're going to leave it there. Francisco Blanche of uh, B of A Securities uh, and Brian Sullivan, thank you very much. Kelly. All right, up next, the global crisis from the coronavirus. It's cast a cloud, a cloud of death, despair, and extreme financial anxiety across the whole world. And as we now look to begin Holy Week in the observance of Passover, our faith and spiritual metal is being tested like never before. When we return, a conversation with Bishop Robert Barrett. Get social with TuneIn. Follow TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to discover what's happening in the app and around the world. Be the first to know about upcoming games and the hottest new music. Follow at TuneIn and always be in the know. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn from the App Store today. Keep up with everything happening in the wild world of pro wrestling with a TuneIn podcast. For expert analysis straight from the WWE to Steve Austin's no-holds-barred conversations with wrestling's biggest personalities, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling to listen. Are you curious what others are listening to on TuneIn? Head to the trending section under Browse to see the most popular stations and podcasts among TuneIn listeners right now. Check it out. You might just discover something new for yourself. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. This is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Join me for CNN's new podcast, Coronavirus, Fact versus Fiction. We know you have questions. We want to help you find answers. And send me your questions on social media at Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Make sure to search and listen on TuneIn today. It's TuneIn Sports on this day. April 6, 1992, Duke's men's basketball beats Michigan 71 to 51. Winning back-to-back -back titles for the Blue Devils. Fired, and here comes Duke on the break. Behind the back, early the Hill. Why not? That's the play that was available. Nobody back for Michigan because they're sending five to the board. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search boards to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. There are no fewer than 19,000 funeral homes across the country. And all of them are bracing for uh, double the number of deaths they typically handle at this time of the year. And, of course, it is all because of the coronavirus. Contessa Brewer has more on the steps they are taking to prepare for this onslaught. Contessa. Tyler, even in small villages, they are bracing for what's to come inside this funeral home in Socrates. They are begging suppliers for masks and the face shields they desperately need. And the situation in New York City is difficult to comprehend so are the pictures, and we're going to show you some of these now. As mobile morgues, dozens of them are lined up outside of hospitals in New York City, being filled with bodies as we speak. FEMA is sending even more of those mobile morgues coming in. A city councilman says soon the morgue freezers will be full and temporary burials will likely take place in trenches in city parks. 
Cremations now take place around the clock, and the National Funeral Directors Association has put out a nationwide call for professionals to volunteer across the country. Social distancing means an end to funerals as we know them. We're trying to find any possible way to give people comfort, you know, that, that, they, that they're not getting. You know, keep in mind, people are not being able to, to say goodbye to their loved ones in the hospital. Many families are now opting for funerals, that is, on these online platforms where as many as 100 mourners can participate in the ceremony. And those few immediate family members who were allowed to attend a memorial service inside this funeral home today were greeted by signs reminding them no handshakes, no hugging, and if you feel sick, you should stay out. So tough. Contessa, thanks very much. Contessa Brewer there. Throughout this coronavirus pandemic, we as a network have been covering both the tragic loss of life and the epic collapse of our global economies. But as we begin Holy Week now and the observance of Passover, we want to take a step back and look at how this crisis is testing our faith. Faith in our institutions, faith in humanity to some extent, and for some, even their faith in God. Here to help shepherd us through these troubled waters, Bishop Robert Barron is founder of Word on Fire Ministries and Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Bishop, it's a pleasure to have you, an honor to have you here. Welcome. Bishop Barron, if you can hear me, I'm curious what your message would be to our viewers during this time. Well, we'll try that link again in just a moment. Get the Barrett back, Bishop back online. We'll, Ty? It'll be a fascinating conversation, and uh, we'll get him back if we can. Uh, the markets, of course, rallying today. That's the good news uh, amidst all of this uh, trouble, up by uh, better than 1,100 points. The ETF that tracks retail stocks climbing more than 9%, but it is still lower by about 35% from where it started the year. We'll tell you, however, about some select names to buy, and there are some. That's next. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app to see the latest editions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Get social with TuneIn. Follow TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to discover what's happening in the app and around the world. Be the first to know about upcoming games and the hottest new music. Follow at TuneIn and always be in the know. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Want to know a great way to discover the latest and greatest sports audio on TuneIn? It's easy. Just make sure push notifications are enabled on your phone to receive recommendations of sports talk, radio, and podcasts, along with important breaking news updates. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn from the App Store today. Behind the highlight reels, championship rings, and colossal paychecks, there are sports stories that fuel, deepen, and even challenge our love for the game. For true tales of underdogs, anti-heroes, and game-changing innovators, explore a sports documentary on TuneIn, like Sports Wars, telling the origin stories of classic rivalries, Ray's Sports, about the concussion crisis that threatens football's future, and Dunkumentaries, a podcast devoted to the beauty and power of the slam dunk. For these and more, search Sports Documentaries on TuneIn. This is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Join me for CNN's new podcast, Coronavirus, Fact versus Fiction. We know you have questions, and we want to help you find answers. And send me your questions on social media, at Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Make sure to search and listen on TuneIn today. Slash TV. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, a big rally on Wall Street to welcome in the new week. Uh, the major averages having their biggest gains in seven days. The Dow right now up more than 1,200 points. So 
Is it safe to dip your toe or maybe even a whole foot back into the market? And what are some of the best opportunities out there right now? Well, Matt Roddy is here to tell us. He's vice president and portfolio manager with Rockland Trust. Matt, welcome. Good to have you with us as we're up 1,245 points. Um, what do you think here? Is this a false bottom or the real thing? Uh, good afternoon, Charlie. Yes, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I actually think we've put in the bottom, Tyler. If, uh, if all indications are uh, the news with the coronavirus continues to show that the worst case scenarios are maybe not, no longer on the table, I think we spent much of March uh, hearing about how we missed the opportunity to prevent the crisis. However, I think we're starting to hear now news that we are on the other end of the spectrum, uh, looking better to avoid the worst case scenarios as we see Italy. Uh, and some, some other countries uh, improving and our own uh, growth curve starting to come in line with what they did when they uh, went through a similar period. So I'm, I'm getting optimistic that, you know, when we hit that 35% or so sell-off, uh, that was uh, the bottom. Now, it doesn't mean we can't retrace a little of that as the news ebbs and flows. I don't think every day we're going to hear good news for sure. And the, you, know, you can't underestimate the, the human tragedy and, the, and then the way that plays on people's psyches. Uh, you know, but I think in the long term, not even the long term, maybe even by the end of this year, we're going to look back at this as a, a larger human tragedy, uh, quite frankly, than the long term financial damage that it may have inflected, inflected on our economy. I think that'll yeah. be a little bit more short term in nature. I'm, I'm sure we're going to see. I'm sure we're going to see a lot of very painful images over the next few weeks, and among them will be people frustrated at their inability to get unemployment checks or waiting on telephone lines for hours and hours and hours uh, to get through to their states. Uh, which would suggest to me that maybe the consumer economy comes back a little more slowly than other parts of the economy. What are the sectors you like most right now? Uh, well, in the sectors, I think the banks have been really beaten up, and I think part of it is just there's so much in the in the crosshairs of, of trying to get this stimulus money out. Um, you know, the, then the net interest margin. So I think they've been you know uh, unfairly probably beaten up a little too much. I think there's some value in the banks for sure. Um, you know, consumer discretionary right. certainly comes to mind, too. There's some, some names there. Um, I'm not talking about the ones that may not survive, but there's some names there that got thrown out with, with you know, the baby with the bathwater, if you will. All right. Got to leave it there, Matt. Thank you very much. Matt Roddy, Rockland Trust, we appreciate it very much. We'll have you back again soon. Kelly. All righty. The coronavirus pandemic, like we said, is testing people's faith and technology as well. Uh, we're going to try to speak to Bishop Robert Barron about that next. Stay with us. Want to know a great way to discover the latest and greatest sports audio on TuneIn? It's easy. Just make sure push notifications are enabled on your phone to receive recommendations of sports talk, radio, and podcasts, along with important breaking news updates. Want to know a quick, easy way to see if your favorite podcasts have a new episode available? Just go to the home screen on your TuneIn app to see the latest editions under the Your New Episode section. Happy listening. Behind the highlight reels, championship rings, and colossal paychecks, there are sports stories that fuel, deepen, and even challenge our love for the game. For true tales of underdogs, antiheroes, and game-changing innovators, search sports documentaries on the TuneIn app. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn from the App Store today. Stop breaches. Try it free today. Providing a layer of protection you can count on, WeatherTech features non-porous surfaces that can easily be wiped with germ-killing disinfectants and can easily be washed out for complete protection, front, back, and even up the sides. It's not so easy with carpet mats. Stay safe with WeatherTech. The ultimate protection for your vehicle. Order today at WeatherTech.com. We cannot do all the good that the world needs. But right now, the world needs all the good that we can do. Everyone working to keep America strong. Thank you. 
Welcome back. As we said, it's been such a trying time for everybody getting through coronavirus. Here to help shepherd us through these troubled waters is Bishop Robert Barron, the founder of Ward on Fire Ministries, the auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Bishop, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Wonderful. Um, welcome, and, and we would love to know, um, what is your message to our viewers, especially with Holy Week now and, and heading into Passover? What's, what is your message during these difficult times? If I could put it very simply, it's to enter into what we call the Paschal Mystery, which is the dying and rising of Jesus, in a way to come face to face with the darkness of life, with death itself. That's essential to this Holy Week. But death leading to resurrection is the great rhythm of the Christian life. And so, in a way, this is a Lent we'll never forget. This is what we do. We, we face death with the confidence of the resurrection. What do you say to people when they say, you know, Bishop, and, and again, you're somebody who's so well-versed in the stuff that's on social media and on the Internet. You were one of the first to put up yeah. YouTube videos. It's led to your uh, position today. So, and you often really enjoy to engage with people and are very effective in engaging with people on these subjects. So what do you say when people say to you, you know, why, why would God let these pandemics happen, Bishop, why? You know, the short answer is I don't know, and no one does. God has a providential plan. God is provident over all things. God wills and God permits. Now, what's the ultimate purpose of all that? I don't know, and no one knows this side of this side of heaven. But whatever happens, or whatever God permits, there's an opening of a door to love. There's the possibility of love, and that's what what we look for, especially at the dark times. What is my opportunity right here, right now, to love? That's what God wants. That's cooperating with God's will. You know, one of the topics that even, you know, is a point of discussion in my own family is the decision some churches have made to close during this time. And not just yeah. to close uh, masses, but in some case in my area to close their doors altogether, um, to suspend yeah. things like baptisms and in some cases funerals, mm -hmm. except in, in extreme emergencies. And even the papal yeah. secretary to the Pope has warned that if, you, if the church turn, turns its back on people in this time of crisis, they'll turn their back on the church. Are you concerned about that? Yeah. And I've been around the table. It's not been my decision to make uh, ultimately, but I've been around the table. We discuss these things. And it's been painful. I mean, no church leader wants ever to close the doors of our churches. That's our whole reason for being. But we just perceive that this thing is so dangerous and gathering people together in one place, especially a lot of elderly people, you know, who tend to come to church, we just felt this was putting people at too great a risk. We hate it. No one likes it. We hope it's over soon. But we felt this was the most prudential decision at the, at the time. My hope is that when the day comes, I hope it's fairly soon, when we can come back to church, we do so in a very festive way. But for the time being, I think we had to do it. You know, uh, Bishop Baron Tyler Matheson here. I, I'm very interested. I, I was uh, struck by your, your mentioning Lent, uh, where uh, Christian yeah. believers uh, often give something up, and we've all been asked to give something up. Uh, and also the confluence yeah. of Passover this week, which is a holiday that also has its uh, its dark side as well, but both uh, yep. end up uh, in the light. But I'd like to come back to something Kelly asked a moment ago about yep. why does God allow these things to happen? Does God intend these things to happen, bad things to happen, or does he or she permit them to happen? Yeah, and the tradition uses both those terms. I think sometimes God does actively will things to happen, but at the very least, God permits. And in the case of evil, we use that language. That God doesn't create or cause evil, but God permits it. Now, that does beg the question, well, why? Well, sometimes we can see. Sometimes out of evil comes a great good that wouldn't have come otherwise. Now, what is it in this case? I don't know. And no one knows. It, maybe we won't know for 100 years. But in any case, we have an opportunity to love. And that's always cooperating with God's will. So permission, when it comes to evil, is the right language to use. Well, Bishop Barron, we so, uh, again, appreciate your time and, and you joining us today and everything you guys are doing. I know you have uh, movies on St. Francis of Assisi, among a lot of other free resources right yeah. now, so people can reach out and find those. Thanks for joining us. God bless you all. Thanks. And you. Tyler, closing bell has to pick up after that. How do you think they feel? <laughs> That's a tough act to follow. Uh, <laughs>
That's a spiritual note. And this really is a spiritual test uh, for everybody, whether you've uh, been affected directly by this, uh, this illness or, t- or, or tangentially by it. It is a spiritual test. Uh, a test of the heart, a test of the will, and of the spirit. Thanks for watching our breaking news coverage, and we continue now into the last hour of the trading day with the folks at Closing Bell. Tyler and Kelly, thank you. Hard to follow that bishop indeed. But welcome, everyone. I'm Sarah Eisen here with Michael Santoli today, who's in for Wilford Frost. Stocks are snapping back in a big way today. Major indices up more than 5%. Sectors like retail seeing their best day in over a decade. Let's look at what's driving the action higher on Wall Street. New data from the state of New York and around the world showing the spread of the virus may be leveling off, indicating extreme measures may have begun to have an impact. Encouraging signs of progress on both a vaccine and treatment options over the weekend. But there are more warning signs as well. China, for instance, reporting an increase of cases. And U.S. officials warning this week will be the toughest yet as hospitals struggle to maintain and expand their capacity. And coming up on today's show, Blackstone is donating millions of dollars to support health care workers and first responders in New York. We'll speak with Blackstone CEO Steve Schwartzman about that move and his thoughts on this volatile market. Plus, we'll be joined by the head of the Transport Workers Union about his concerns that enough isn't being done to protect his members on the front lines. 59 minutes left of trade. Let's focus on the big stories we are watching right now. Meg Terrell with the latest on treatments for the virus. Peter Cicchini from Kenner Fitzgerald is with us to talk about the volatility in the oil market in particular. But first, Mike, why don't you get your take on today's rally and where this puts us? Yes, yeah, so actually a pretty crisp rally. You can't really argue with that. But where it takes us to is actually perhaps one of the most interesting uh, things in terms of levels. A one-year chart of the S&P 500 right here, 2630-ish uh, on the S&P 500. It's exactly where we close on March 30th. So you remember that was that big three-day rebound rally off of those lows from March 23rd. Uh, 2630, it's been a little bit of a ceiling. And look at what we did today, rushed right up to that test. Now, what are the tests up beyond that? I'm going to point to these areas around 27 hundred and just above there. 2,700, if you believe March 23rd is plausibly the low for this phase right now, it, it really fell off a cliff and became a disorderly overshoot to the downside around that 2,700 level. We had a 12% down day. That's what we'd probably have to get back up to to say that this is a little bit more than a reflex bounce, but it obviously has been brought. Just wanted to take a little bit of a glimpse of the leadership today. Since the market highs, it has been obviously very much a defensive uh, outperformance is what we've seen in the markets here. So here's the uh, consumer staples and the large cap techs and the QQQ. But this is small caps, and that is the banks. Obviously, very wide performance spread. But look at today, and you'll see an inversion of that. So when the market gets a little more confident, when people feel like maybe it's gotten over to the downside, it is the most beaten up stuff that tends to do better. You see the staples uh, being underperformers in a pretty pronounced way. So that's pretty much to be expected when you do get one of these rushes uh, for the risky stuff that's been left behind, Sarah. Really liked your column today. The waiting is the hardest part, Tom Petty and investors. I mean, it it speaks to the fact that nobody has an edge here in terms of what the economy and what the virus is ultimately going to look like. And therefore, it's really hard to make a market call. Right, Sarah. I mean, essentially what the market normally does is looking at this huge set of leading indicators, how economies normally react. Right now, we have this interplay of an epidemic and policy that's extremely hard to handicap, which I guess is why, one reason anyway, why the market has seized on these, you know, tentative, uncertain, contingent signs that maybe we've seen some flattening out of those infection curves. Uh, It makes sense, at least when the market is so oversold, to react to the upside in this way, but it's probably fair to assume we're going to get overshoots and undershoots on a day-to-day basis in both directions. All right, Mike, thanks. Some glimmers of hope emerging in the battle against the coronavirus as hard-hit countries like Italy and Spain have reported a slowing in death and infection rates, and progress is being made on treatments as well. Meg Terrell with more on the response from the pharmaceutical industry. Meg, after another busy weekend of reading for all of us. 
<laughs> it was, Sarah. And one of the nearest term drugs uh, that people are really watching for is Gilead's Remdesivir. We got an open letter from Gilead CEO Dan O'Day posted on Saturday night about the supply of that medicine. Uh, now, this is a complex drug to manufacture. They've been able to ramp up supply to now what they say uh, is enough for about 140,000 treatment courses available by the end of May. And they're making that available at cost as it goes through the clinical trial process. They hope to get up to 500,000 treatment courses by October and more than a million by the end of the year, potentially uh, several million uh, next year if required. Now, Dan O'Day, the CEO, is saying, quote, these are intense ongoing efforts, and while they continue, we must await the data from the clinical trials before we know whether remdesivir is a safe and effective treatment. We're hoping for that data, the first of which in the next few weeks. Meanwhile, we also want to tell you about some news this morning for, from a small biotech company called Veer Biotech, partnering with GlaxoSmithKline on an antibody approach. Now, now, they say they're going to take two antibody candidates into human trials within three to five months. As part of this, GSK also making a $250 million investment in Veer, sending that stock up quite a bit today. And Sarah and Mike, these are the kinds of drugs coming in succession, different technologies that we've heard Scott Gottlieb talking about so much. We need different approaches to potentially start to tackle this thing. And we are hoping to see these data uh, from Gilead by the end of April. They will come from China trials first and might be a little bit confusing to decipher. It might not be super clear immediately, but we'll see Gilead's trials after that, guys. And everybody will be very closely watching them, of course. Back over to you. I guess taking it as a good sign that they're ramping production even before they're talking about the efficacy. Meg, what about hydroxychloroquine, which, you know, unfortunately has sort of become politically charged because the president talks about it. But is there any more data coming out on that and how how widespread it's being used in hot zones like New York? Well, by all accounts, it's being used very widely. We don't yet have good clinical trial data to tell us how well it's working. And so that's what we're waiting for. We know that the New York state trial of that started in March, uh, hoping to see that data. I think Governor Cuomo was talking about it today, uh, you know, over the next few weeks, potentially, or months. Um, the current data that exist are flawed, um, and they're what Dr. Anthony Fauci calls anecdotes, not data. Um, so we really need those controlled clinical trial results, experts say, to know if the drug really does work. Meg, thank you very much. Uh, talk to you uh, again soon, I'm sure. Oil falling today, despite earlier comments from the CEO of Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund, RDIF, hinting that an oil deal between Saudi Arabia and Russia is close. This comes on the heels of oil posting its best week on record and ahead of a potential meeting between OPEC and its allies on Thursday. For more, let's bring in Peter Cicchini. He is global market strategist and head of cross-asset strategy at Cantor Fitzgerald. Peter, it's, uh, it's good to see you. Um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for being here. Now, uh, obviously, huge rally in oil, as we mentioned, didn't has not really given back very much of it. I mean, it rallied up to 29, giving back uh, a couple dollars here. What's your view on whether anything is really going to change uh, on the supply front, what it means uh, for the crude price? Well, you know, I've, I've taken a bit more of a, a cynical, uh, nuanced view of the dynamic in the oil market right now. And I'm really, frankly, not all that convinced that this is an all-out fistfight between uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia. I think it might be a little bit um, more of a veiled attempt, frankly, by both of them uh, to take a swipe at U.S. E&P while U.S. E&P uh, has been shut out of the capital markets. Uh, and the dance that they're doing right now around this upcoming Thursday meeting, I think, is just that. I think it's a dance, uh, and I think it uh, creates the narrative that they want most people to believe, but I'm not sure that it's, that it's quite true. So that implies uh, not much upside from crude from here, if any. I mean, obviously, demand is down uh, tremendously and looks like it'll stay that way for a little while. So where does that bring you in terms of a broader uh, kind of investment strategy for the energy sector and, and other parts of the market? You know, I think, look, I, I do, by the way, think on Thursday we get some sort of a um, some sort of a deal that just uh, makes it look as if there's cooperation afoot. But, but let's face it, that oil price is this low for U.S. E&P doesn't really matter very much because even the Permian producers have break-evens in the low 40s. And so I think, unfortunately, uh, the the next uh, bit of pain now will come from the defaults that are likely to arise, um, especially because now capital markets are, are closed. And, and for that reason, 
uh, even though obviously valuations in the sector are depressed. I think it's actually time to sort of wait and see uh, relative to, to who the survivors are in the space uh, and then wait to fix spots uh, after, after the damage has been done in full. Are you not convinced, Peter, that, that President Trump can intervene in a bigger way? I mean, he's already said he's spoken to both of them, that they will make a deal. He's met with the energy executives. He's clearly focused on this issue. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, you look, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't really think that um, he has perhaps as much influence um, as uh, one might think in this situation. Uh, if we remember at a G20 meeting not all that long ago, there's quite a bit of camaraderie between the Saudis and the Russians. The Russians are well positioned to withstand this. Yes, it does hurt them in the short term. Yes, it does hurt the Saudis in the short term. But I think this is a bit of a longer game for them uh, than it is for us. And I think their interests, in fact, are quite aligned uh, relative to what it's going to do to U.S. E&P companies, uh, uh, unfortunately. Peter Cicchini. Nice to have you. Thank you. Thank you. After the break, Jamie Dimon out with his annual shareholder letter with a fresh warning about the impact of the pandemic. We'll bring you those highlights next. And later, Blackstone CEO Steve Schwartzman joins us for first on CNBC interview, his take on the market volatility, plus Blackstone's big philanthropic move announced today in New York. That's coming up. CNBC Sector Sword is sponsored by Sector Spider ETFs. Spider ETFs. Visit us on the web at sectorspiders.com. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn from the App Store today. Get social with TuneIn. Follow TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to discover what's happening in the app and around the world. Be the first to know about upcoming games and the hottest new music. Follow at TuneIn and always be in the know. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn on the App Store today. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Want to know a great way to discover the latest and greatest sports audio on TuneIn? It's easy. Just make sure push notifications are enabled on your phone to receive recommendations of sports talk radio and podcasts, along with important breaking news updates. It's tune in sports on this day. April 6, 1992, Duke's men's basketball beats Michigan 71 to 51, winning back to back titles for the Blue Devils. Fired, and here comes Duke on the break behind the back early. The Hill, why not? That's the play that was available. Nobody back for Michigan because they're sending five to the board. To listen to conversations breaking down the moments just like this, search sports to be part of the discussion on TuneIn. Hey everyone, it's Tremaine Lee, MSNBC correspondent and host of the new podcast, Into America. In our latest episode, Republican giant and longtime Senator Lindsey Graham is for the first time ever facing a real challenge to his Senate seat. Can a relative newcomer to the scene, a black Democrat in a red state, win this fight? I head to South Carolina to find out. Search for Into America wherever you're listening right now and subscribe. Behind the highlight reels, championship rings, and colossal paychecks, there are sports stories that fuel, deepen, and even challenge our love for the game. For true tales of underdogs, antiheroes, and game-changing innovators, explore a sports documentary on TuneIn. Like Sports Wars, telling the origin stories of classic rivalries, Ray's Sports, about the concussion crisis that threatens football's future, and Dunkumentaries, a podcast devoted to the beauty and power of the slam dunk. For these and more, search sports documentaries on com slash ed. 
There are about uh, 46 minutes left to go in this session. Here's a check on the markets. All the indexes trading pretty close to their highs for the day. You see a 6% rally for the Dow, just under that for the S&P and the Nasdaq. Uh, let's take a look at some individual market movers. Spotify getting hit with a downgrade from Raymond James on quarantine concerns. The firm says concert delays and extended time indoors could be a risk to Spotify, adding that this could mean a user shift to Amazon Music given increased smart speaker listening instead of smartphone, presumably. And Wayfair says its business is booming as people redecorate while staying indoors amid the coronavirus outbreak. The online furniture store announcing that when it entered March, gross revenue growth was just under 20%, which was similar to trends during January and February. But by the end of the month, growth had more than doubled. We're getting some breaking news here, Mike, uh, out of the UK. Sue Herrera with the news for us, too. Thank you very much, Sarah. Here's what's happening, everyone. We now know that the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who uh, came down with coronavirus last week, has now, his condition has worsened. He has been taken into intensive care at this point. Uh, this is from 10 Downing Street. Over the course of this afternoon, the condition of the Prime Minister worsened. On the advice of his medical team, he has been moved to the intensive care unit. The Prime Minister has asked Foreign Secretary Dominic Robb, who is the first Secretary of State, to deputize him where necessary. They say that basically Mr. Robb will be taking charge of the government at, at this point. Uh, interesting enough, this morning, Mr. Robb was asked that very question, whether or not he was, go was ready to take over the government. He said the prime minister is fine and is fully in charge. Obviously, that has changed over just the past couple of hours with the prime minister's condition worsening. He's in intensive care. And for all extents and purposes, Dominic Robb, the uh, first foreign secretary of state, is now in charge in the U.K. If we get any further updates, Sarah, we will give them to you. But right now, Dominic Robb is in charge in the U.K. Back to you. Sue Herrera, of course. We pray for uh, the people of the UK and yes. for the Prime Minister on that sad development. I just want to also draw your attention to the British pound, which got hit pretty hard on this news. Obviously, a shocking headline, which raises the uncertainty factor for the UK. Uh, the pound versus the dollar, you can see the intraday drop as Sue was coming out there reporting that news. That Prime Minister Boris Johnson will be admitted to intensive care and the Foreign Secretary will be leading in the interim. Meantime, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon publishing his annual letter this morning, which almost exclusively addressed the coronavirus impact on that bank. Dimon predicting a bad recession and elements of financial strain like he saw in the 2008 financial crisis. In his letter, Dimon also applauded the Fed's overwhelming actions, which, quote, dramatically reduced financial stress. Diamond was confident that the bank remained strong. It would not need federal relief, he said, and would continue to lend to customers. Interestingly, he did spell out a severely adverse scenario. GDP growth of negative 35 percent, unemployment of 14 percent, still in the fourth quarter, under which the bank's board, he said, would can likely consider suspending its dividend. And actually, that dividend of banks was a topic I brought up earlier with the former Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen in an exclusive interview this morning. Here's what she said about that topic. I would be in favor of uh, asking the banks to suspend dividends and stock buybacks. They worry that it will make them look uh, as though they're vulnerable and that um, there's a reason that they have uh, stopped dividends, that uh, they see that they have difficulties. But um, if the regulators ask them to do that, on the grounds that we need a banking system that's able to meet the credit needs of the economy, and we don't know how severe or long-lasting um, this pandemic will be. Um, I think that's a different situation. So, Mike, clearly Yellen's in favor of the Fed telling the banks to suspend their dividends. It's obviously a sensitive topic because you know, we had Morgan Stanley CEO on this program last week. Goldman Sachs CEO was on Squawk on the Street and a number of other city, Mike Corbett, all saying, you know, they're not going to suspend their dividends. It's, it's obviously a, a 
difficult topic for them. Sure. And I can what would happen to these bank stocks if they did have to do something like that? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's not surprising that J.P. Morgan, according to, to Jamie Dimon's letter, would have been self-administered a tougher stress test than, in fact, the regulators do. And under that scenario, maybe if things stay worse uh, than expected, uh, then obviously it has to be on the table, really, to, to, to preserve uh, capital. I also wonder if banks would look for a collective way to do it if it came down to that, as they did with the buyback, so that it wouldn't seem as if uh, you know one institution was worse off than others in, in, in having to do that. But I do think uh, the dividend question is probably still a little ways off before we really know the depth and duration of what we're dealing with. Uh, too bad Wilfred's not here. He would have loved to weigh in on this topic. He'll be back tomorrow, and I'm sure we'll still be talking about bank dividends. We've got about 40 minutes left of trade, and take a look at stocks. Still flying higher here. The Dow's up 1,226 points, a gain of almost 6%, almost 6, 5.5% for the S&P. Every sector now in the green, and banks are among the best performers. Utilities and materials also at the top of the list. Retail's doing well today as well. After the break, the lockdown has hit brick-and-mortar retailers hard. We're going to discuss the fallout for commercial real estate with one billionaire real estate mogul who owns some of the most well-known properties in California. That's next. Did you know TuneIn doesn't just live here on your smart speaker? From the audio that moves you to the audio that gets you moving. Soundtrack your every movement with the free TuneIn app. Available on your phone or tablet. Download TuneIn from the App Store today. Want to know a great way to discover the latest and greatest sports audio on TuneIn? It's easy. Just make sure push notifications are enabled on your phone to receive recommendations of sports talk, radio, and podcasts, along with important breaking news updates. Get social with TuneIn. Follow TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to discover what's happening in the app and around the world. Be the first to know about upcoming games and the hottest new music. Follow at TuneIn and always be in the know. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Are you curious what others are listening to on TuneIn? Head to the trending section under Browse to see the most popular stations and podcasts among TuneIn listeners right now. Check it out. You might just discover something new for yourself. Hey everyone, it's Tremaine Lee, MSNBC correspondent and host of the new podcast, Into America. In our latest episode, Republican giant and longtime Senator Lindsey Graham is for the first time ever facing a real challenge to his Senate seat. Can a relative newcomer to the scene, a black Democrat in a red state, win this fight? I head to South Carolina to find out. Search for Into America wherever you're listening right now and subscribe. This is Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Join me for CNN's new podcast, Coronavirus, Fact versus Fiction. We know you have questions, and we want to help you find answers. And send me your questions on social media, at Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Make sure to... Welcome back. E-commerce warehouse company seeing a boost today on the back of a surge in demand. Frank Holland has that story about this uh, delivery-centric economy, Frank. Hey there, Mike. You know, shares of Prologis up more than 6.5%. During a business update today, the global leader in e-commerce warehousing saying lease signings. Those are up 16% year-over-year in March. That rise largely sparked by online buying during the pandemic. Also, short-term leasing is up 44%, and the CEO said... The short-term surge in demand is real for e-commerce warehousing. Blackstone, with a large e-commerce warehouse investment trading higher along with Duke Realty and Toreno, Perla just added it expects inventory levels to rise at U.S. stores as much as 10% this year, also increasing demand. Back over to you. Maybe we can ask Steve Schwartzman about it next hour. Frank, thank you. Thank you. Frank Holland. Well, while some online sales are certainly seeing a bump, more retailers are announcing furloughs today, including home furnishing business RH and Michael Kors' parent company, Capri Holdings. 
Workers from these two companies join the hundreds of thousands of other retail employees that have been furloughed from companies like Macy's and Ross stores over just the past week as these retailers grapple with the effects of the coronavirus pandemic. Joining us now for his outlook is Rick Caruso, CEO and founder of Caruso. Caruso is a California-based real estate company that owns and manages a number of shopping center retail properties like The Grove in Los Angeles. Rick, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sarah. You know, we, we announce these furloughs every day. Uh, it's a devastating number. How do you think about these jobs? Are they lost or, or will they come back? Well, I hope they come back. I think some are going to be lost. Listen, the retail environment is tough out there right now. I think the important thing to think about is that the biggest threat to brick and mortar retail is really the current version of themselves. Many of them have to evolve. Many of them have to change because the consumer is going to change. This crisis, I believe, is going to change consumer culture, their expectations, uh, what they want from retailers in a really significant way. And so there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers. I think the winners are going to be very connected. They're going to be curated. They're going to feel more local. They're going to feel more personalized and they're going to have a better value proposition. And there's many out there that were doing that before this crisis began, and they'll continue to do it. And I think be rewarded with great success, and hopefully they will drive a lot of hiring, and there will be more retail jobs uh, coming back into the current economy. Rick, this change perhaps in consumer culture, will it not include maybe uh, less willingness just to go out uh, into stores, into malls uh, altogether? I mean, it's hard to project exactly how the uh, aftermath is going to to shape up here from all this. But uh, are you worried about that uh, possibility? You know, I'm not personally worried about it for my portfolio because my portfolio is all outdoor. And I think people after isolation uh, have a great appreciation for outdoors and fresh air and seeing trees and a, and a blue sky. So I think we're in a very good uh, position. I do think that people are going to want to have more physical space. I think they're going to operate differently. Listen, 9-11 fundamentally changed our habits as human beings. But the one thing that is always crystal clear is we're human souls that want to have a sense of connection and community, and our properties provide that. The challenge for retailers inside their four walls is going to be to meet the customer where the customer wants them to be. And so the very innovative, very smart retailers, I think, are going to do very well. Now, when you get to crowded restaurants and things like that, I think they're going to have to change how they operate. Uh, Movie theaters may have to change how they operate for a while. There's certainly going to be a shift. But what we have seen is that isolation gets very tiring. Uh, very quickly. So I think people are going to want to come out and they're going to want to celebrate life and they want to connect with their community. Rick, are your retail and restaurant tenants paying rent right now? You know, some are and some aren't. And uh, the ones that I worry about the most and I care about a lot uh, are the smaller ones, the entrepreneurs, the people that have started a small business, a small restaurant. And we're leaning in with all of those to support them. I'm a big believer that the economy is built off the back of the individual entrepreneur, and we're going to support them to get them reopened so they can rehire and and move forward. The tenants that are more credit worthy and credit tenants, which is a big chunk of our portfolio, uh, they have been paying. My expectation is that I think they should, uh, given these times. 